time I hear that bio, I'm like, wow. Someone's a really good writer. Uh, First, I want to say thank you so much to you, Pastor Walter, and your wife for bringing us. Um, It's really an honor to be here. I'm extremely, extremely excited about being back in this region. Um, We were here not long ago um, with um, Elizabeth, and she brought in many uh, great men and women of God. So obviously, we were just getting to know each other, and I'm excited about just what God is going to do this weekend. I want to say even before I really get too deep into this, um, I'm not conventional. Um, and I, I tell you this not in a way to, um, I, I just want you to know, basically, I don't know anything about church. Like, I'm not, I, I, I didn't really grow up in church like that. I, I, we went a little bit, but we were, like, backslidden. So, so when we would go, we would um, just sort of, like, go to the pizza party for the youth event. And then we had, uh, we lived in Ohio, so we had, like, amusement parks and so every year the the uh, ministry went to amusement parks and that was my experience of going to church uh, whenever they were in services the youth we were down in the basement and we were playing video games so I, I don't remember anything about learning about Jesus growing up we didn't learn the kingdom and to add to that we were um, we were a denomination that was not open to the move of the Holy Spirit So as a result of that, I don't really know anything about church. Um, And I've come to realize that at times that can become a great advantage. um, And there are times where that can also be a disadvantage. But with that, the powerful thing about it, at 18 years old, I had my first encounter with the Holy Spirit. Um, I walked into a church um, and this church, I figured it was going to be like every other church that I had gone to or that I had walked into the doors of. I was so unfamiliar with the Holy Spirit. That the first time I heard someone speak in tongues, I I remember looking at the person whose father it was, and I said, I didn't know that you guys were African. And, and, And you know what's messed up? They never told me. They just laughed and just kept moving. So I I could have met Jesus way back then, um, and and they didn't allow me to meet Jesus. So, um, you know, that was how unfamiliar I was with an atmosphere of the Holy Spirit's presence. I didn't know anything about the anointing. I didn't know anything about the glory. In many ways, I had put the power of God in the past, and I did not believe that the power of God could be manifested in the here and now. And so I remember walking into uh, the building. I'll never forget that even once we got to the parking lot, I'll never forget that I immediately began to be gripped and arrested by the Holy Spirit. I started weeping and crying before we even got inside. You could hear the music all the way outside. And when I got to the front door, I started trembling and shaking. I did not know that I was experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit. And I remember once we got inside, I started acting. (laughs) So funny. Because I didn't know what to do. And everyone was worshiping. I'll never forget that all the worship was married together as one sound. Though everyone was doing something different, every single sound was like a divine symphony. And that's really where we get that word accord. It's the word symphoneo. And so this means when we worship, it's it's actually a divine orchestra. Every person is an instrument in the presence of God. And as everyone started worshiping, I just was, you know, I had my hands up, I had them raised, and I continued to um, just kind of blend in with the crowd. But I honestly, I was, I knew that I had walked into a place that this was not normal. And then I heard for the first time someone that's actually anointed preach. And I said, oh my God, there's a difference. He, and, and here's how you knew it was anointed. He preached for probably three hours. And it felt like five minutes went by. There was revelation. There was authority. There was fire on his words. There was just something different about him. And I remember just being so captivated. I was crying. I could not stop the tears from flowing down my eyes. And then the moment that he stopped, it was like instant supernatural. That sound just came back into the room. Everyone worshiping instantly. So I closed my eyes again. And next thing I know, he's standing in front of me. And when he's standing in front of me, I remember being uncomfortable because I didn't know anything about prophecy. And he looked at me and he said, he said, you are going to preach the gospel to the nations. And then after he said it, though I had never heard a prophecy, it's like something I just knew that God was speaking to me. 
and he was speaking to the innermost parts of my being. Uh, I surrendered my life to Jesus. Once I surrendered my life to Jesus, I had a full year of visitations from the Holy Spirit. I had visitations from angels during that time period. And I had um, a few visitations of the Lord Jesus. And it was in that year that I'll never forget. Um, I'll tell you one, one encounter, and I'm just sort of leading my way into the teaching today. But I began to... Uh, experience God in the church that I was in though they understood the presence of God they, they did not have a lot of revelation of the kingdom and so there were things that I was experiencing that even my pastors did not have a grid for because you can be in the supernatural but you can be in the ankle deep dimensions of the supernatural for example the Bible says that in my father's house there are many mansions that word mansions, that dealing with houses, it means the word economy. So in other words, in my father's house, there are many different economies, but also it lets us know there are many places. There are dimensions. There are realms. There are doors. There are windows. There are gates. There are, there, the Bible talks about angels that lost their estate, so this means there's a, there's a habitation of angels, a dwelling place, houses for angels. <laughs> so what I'm saying is, so though they were experiencing some of the supernatural, they weren't very deep into it. And so I would explain something and people began to convince me that it was wrong to burn. And this began to be the reoccurring theme was that you could not be on fire, and if you were, something was wrong with you. And I remember beginning to, to feel this way, but I continued to pursue Jesus. I didn't, because I didn't really grow up in church, when, when someone would preach something, I took it as I actually believed it. I had nothing in my mind. There was no theology that was there to really fight against it. There was no stronghold in my mind against necessarily what they were teaching. So whenever they would teach it, it didn't have to filter through generations of theology. So when they would say things like, you know, there are people that have prayed for 12 hours. I'd be like, ah, okay, I'm going to pray for 12 hours. And this is how I thought. So in this time of, of prayer, um, my first encounter um, was actually with the angel of the Lord. And I remember I was, um, I was actually, I went to prayer and then I went to sleep. And I woke up because there was a, a tap on my shoulder. And once I was tapped on my shoulder, I looked and there was no one standing there. So I figured I must have just been dreaming. I don't know. And I went back to sleep. But then I get tapped again. But this time when I, when I wake up, I can feel the presence of a person. Like a physical person next to me, but I still could not see anyone. It reminds me of when the Lord visited Samuel, and he said, he called Samuel's name. It says the, in the Bible, the, Samuel stood there, but he couldn't see him. So there are times where we're having a visitation, but your spiritual eyes don't open up to see the visitation, though you experience the activity of that demonstration or of that visitation. And so what happened was this angel starts to speak in my ear. I can hear the, I can feel the breath of the angel, just like a person whispering in your ear, just as real, not different at all. And the angel says, I, I'm an angel of the Lord, and I was sent to bring you a message. Now, here's where my problem came in with this. When the angel began to speak, I did not hear words. Many times when people say that they desire to hear the voice of God, we are asking God to conform to how we communicate, not knowing that the Lord brings us into higher modes of communication and when he started to speak water came out of the angel's mouth and I began to be filled with living water and as he was filling me with with living water I could actually feel the water going in my ear and down into my spirit and as I felt it going into my spirit the encounter was over now for a long time I would wrestle with what even happened there like why would God send an angel to me to tell me a message that I don't know what he actually said to me? But I began to notice that when I, when I traced myself back to that day, I understood mysteries. The secrets and mysteries of the kingdom 
that God was calling me to steward began to open to me that day. I would sit and I would talk to people that had been in ministry for 20 and 30 years. And I would say something to them, and they would always tell me, where'd you learn that? Where'd you go to Bible school? And I go, I, I never went to Bible school. I'm a three-time Bible school dropout. <laughs> I don't think there's a problem with Bible school, by the way. Um, but, I, but it was never the path that God wanted me to go on. And so anyway, this began to open up these different encounters and fast-forwarding. Um, I be, I stayed submitted, served, and all, did all these things in the, in the church that I was a part of. Eventually, we land ourselves in Jacksonville. Fast-forwarding years later, the Lord speaks to us, brings a shift into our ministry. And when he brings a shift into our ministry, it was a, one of the first times that I've heard the audible voice of God. And the Lord shouted two words to me, and this, this was actually in 2014. So we had, we had started, but many times, sometimes you'll begin ministry, and, it's, and you have what I call an Isaiah chapter 6 experience, where you were already prophesying, but then the Lord actually sends you into something. And to, in 2014, the Lord shouted these words to me, and, and they were, there was two simple words. He said, revival and awakening. But when he shouted these words, the fire of God filled me when he said it and I'll never forget that after that day when I would preach the preaching was never the same again there was fire on everything that we did and I started to notice that over the years God continued to add dimensions to us we would move in one realm and then when we felt like we had uh, I'm not going to say mastered but when we felt like we had come to maturity in a certain reality of God, we would find ourselves in kindergarten again in a different dimension, in a different realm. And so here it is, fast forwarding. We're casting out devils. We're healing the sick. We're having tremendous miracles and results. We're in a difficult city. In the city that we are in, uh, Jacksonville, Florida, it is the murder, murder capital of Florida. Sometimes the parents that are part of our ministry, their, their children are involved in gangs. And so we're dealing with very interesting situations. I have been involved with going to, to visit children in prison. Um, I've been involved with um, literal having to pray for a mother whose child murdered someone. I've seen so many different situations being in such a hard and difficult territory. And so I'll never forget that in this territory, the Lord began to show me, and this isn't the text yet, but he began to take me into the book of Nahum. And when I was asking God, why is our city so hard? Because we would try to leave. I don't know if I have any leaders in the house. But there would be days where we would go, you know what, God, you, you have to be calling us somewhere else. And we would bring up, like you did say that we were going to build a church in Orlando. It must be time. And, and we would try to go, and the Lord would speak to us, it's not time to go yet. He said, there's a difference between me sending you somewhere and you being ran out of that place. And we, we began to ask him, and he took me into Nahum, chapter 3. Um, and when he begins to describe this, this city of Nineveh, as he's breaking it down, he calls it a bloody city. And as he declares that it's a bloody city, he finally gets to this place where the Lord spoke to me immediately. And it gets all the way to the end of chapter 3. And he, and he begins to, to say about witchcraft and the harlot. And he describes who buys and who trades families and nations. And the Lord began to speak to me. And he began to show me that you will not see what I desire to do in your city until you begin to confront the powers of witchcraft. Now, the reason why this was difficult for me is though I cast out devils, it really wasn't our main thing. I kind of liked being considered a miracle guy. Because even though there was a little bit of controversy, it's not anything like it was when we began to really go and dive deeper into realms of deliverance ministry. I began to notice the controversy was completely different. Most people are okay if you prophesy. Most people are okay if you believe in healing. But I noticed that when we began to truly confront the kingdom of darkness directly and expose Satan's work, there was levels of criticism that we had never experienced. And so we reached 2020, and now we're armed with this revelation 
of, of, of spiritual warfare that the Lord began to in, unfold to us. But what I told you before is that every dimension or every reality of God has realms and dimensions to it. And for example, let's take raising the dead. Um, in our ministry, we have had three people raised from the dead. Um, we have had people raised from comas. We have seen the power of God in, in very incredible ways, but it's not really so much because of us. It's simply revelation. The Lord, many times, there's revelation that he wants to release to the body because when we have revelation, according to Ephesians, revelation enlightens the eyes of our heart and it gives us access to the inheritance inside of us. So wherever there's not a revelation, there will not be a demonstration. The body of Christ cannot demonstrate what they do not have a revelation of. So we can know that we have power, but we must have a revelation of the working of that power. So there are ways to administer different realms of God. There are mechanics that we can learn about the operations of God. And so I'll use um, this as an example before I get into the actual teaching. But I'll say this. With, with resurrection, we could take when Jesus raised the little girl from the dead. It was extremely powerful that he raised this girl from the dead. But when Jesus reached the house where the little girl was, there were mourners there. And the mourners were present. And what this tells us is that she had just recently died. It means that she was not dead for a long period of time. Now, if we take another resurrection, let's take Lazarus in his resurrection as an example. Now, Lazarus had been dead for three full days and nights. He was raised on the fourth day. We know that Jesus called his name. Now, remember when he was getting ready to pray, what they say is this. They said, his body stinketh by now. This was, this was in reference to the decay process. Now, if there's anyone that's an organ donor that's present here, we all know that after 72 hours, if they take an organ from someone who dies, it cannot be used. It's completely wasted. So if we lived in the modern day and this little girl that died, it, it, let's say she wasn't risen, they could have used her organs still. Lazarus and his organs, they were completely wasted. This means that when Jesus rose him from the dead, it was still resurrection, but it was a higher realm of resurrection than when he raised the little girl from the dead. So what I'm saying is you can be in the prophetic but there are higher realms of the prophetic. You can be in healing, but there's higher realms of healing. And you can be in deliverance, but there are higher realms of deliverance. And I remember that in 2020, we were thrusted into a realm of the deliverance ministry that we had never saw before. We didn't want to be in it. We didn't ask to be in that realm uh, because that realm is one of the more unpopular realms. And I remember it began where we were praying about the condition of our city. And I was crying out to God because there were many people that though we had ministered deliverance to them, they were right back bound. We did everything you could think to do. Disciple, that people would go, well, just disciple them. We would disciple them, and I learned something. You cannot disciple a demon out of a person. Discipleship by itself does not cast the devil out of a person. I began to notice this, and so I was crying out to God, and then I had an encounter with the Lord. And in the encounter, the Lord visited me, and he covered me with fire. And I, and I knew in my spirit that he was putting on me a fire for the deliverance ministry. How many know that when God gives you an encounter, nothing in the kingdom is without a purpose? And so when we encounter him, he's also equipping us. There's something about dreams that God does where he, he equips us for ministry. He equips us for destiny. And so the fire of God comes all over me. I wake up and I'm still burning with fire. I didn't think much about it. I get back to my church and Pastor Walter, the most unusual thing happens. Demons start manifesting everywhere. Now the problem was I didn't say anything for them to manifest. 
I would be preaching on things that had nothing to do with confronting demons, and demons would begin to manifest, and I found myself in a situation where I could let the demons manifest or I could cast them out. And so then the Lord began to do his, his favorite type of training, and that is the on-the-job training school of the Holy Ghost. And that's sometimes that's some of the best training that you could get. And so we begin to learn about this ministry of deliverance as we are in it. As we're going, the Holy Spirit's literally teaching us. And I saw things that were just beyond belief at times. But to make this story short so that I could really get into this teaching, because I want to give a blueprint for territorial transformation. But as I was um, dealing with all these different things, I'll never forget, we were casting out so many devils that I was visited by a principality. This is something that I had never experienced before. The principality came. Um, I felt the strongest witchcraft in this dream than I've ever felt in my entire life. And I've been to Africa. I've run into witch doctors. And, and I'll never forget <laughs> this dream, this spirit attempts to negotiate with me. And the negotiation was simple. If you stop casting us out, will allow your ministry to grow. And I said, oh, my God, I don't want anything from you. And I said, we're going to continue to cast out every demon walking. If it walks near us, if it comes around us, we're going to cast it out. And so I come out of this encounter, and I knew that we were, we were on target with what the Lord wanted us to do. And we continued to cast out devils, and one day this... Um, this girl, she slithers like a snake. She's slithering under her seat in a way that is humanly and physically impossible. And there's no way that it, it can, there's just no way that someone could move that way on their stomach. And as she's slithering, one of um, my spiritual sons, he goes over to her and, and the demon speaks out of the girl and says these words, I am here to challenge Chazda. And I remember sitting and going, you know, what book can I use that will reference <laughs> and so I decided we're not going to allow the devil to dictate what happens in this service. So we're going to continue to minister, and I'll get back to you when I'm ready. And so we end up confronting this, this python. It was a spirit that had entered her bloodline from her family's um, traditions in Trinidad. And once we were able to cast uh, this devil out, it's like it opened something in, in our region and we began to have college students busing themselves from Miami. On, and, and Miami, in a, on, not on a bus, just in a drive, is about five hours, five and a half hours away. And, and we started holding these meetings called Out by Fire. And as we started holding these meetings, we were doing it once a month in 2020. This was during COVID. Um, the enemy was trying to fight us. Uh, they would call the police. Every single time we gathered, especially Sundays, so we would get to the parking lot, the police would be there waiting for us, and they were trying to say there's too many people gathering in that building, and it was every excuse you could think of. We were under so much warfare, but in the midst of it, people were being delivered and set free. People were, were coming into freedom, and people were coming closer and deeper fellowship with Jesus. Now, as this was happening, um, the Lord was, was teaching us more and more, and this went on for a solid two years. We were just casting out devils, and the Lord was increasing our knowledge. I ran into almost, um, almost every demon that I've read in the Bible, I've run into it. I, I saw spirits like legion come out of people. I saw spirits that uh, infirmities, stage four cancer, deafness, blindness, um, all types of spirits that are operating in people's lives, we began to see them come out. And even in our travels, you know, one of the, some of the strongest and most interesting things I noticed is New York demons are different from every other demon I ever ran into. I noticed that even when they manifest, they speak like New Yorkers. They dance like New Yorkers. They move like New Yorkers. And so we saw some interesting things, um, and we began to do online teachings um, and one of them went all around the world um, and is still to this day setting people free from sexual immorality. Um, as the Lord gave us insight into the strong man behind every form of sexual immorality. And so as we began to see this, 
God began to tell us, this is what I've wanted you to do um, to transform your region. And now I want you to know this before I even get, get started. Many times uh, the enemy has created division in the body. Uh, but even amongst those that operate in the supernatural, as if we have to make a choice between moving in the glory and, and being a deliverer. And, and I just want to say this. This is very important for us to understand. Jesus is the embodiment of the glory. And almost every time you turn the page in the gospel, he's casting out devils. When, when you think of Moses, he's a man of the glory. He's a man that we know he knows the glory dimension. But this man moved in, in, in such a realm of deliverance, though. But he was a man that it, when he was 120, it, the Bible lets us know that he didn't even age. His eyes had not gone dim. What type of glory is that? What type of glory was Moses in to, with his outstretched hand to see the Red Sea part because the winds of the Spirit began to blow? So, so obviously, uh, somewhere the enemy has been able to strategically make us think that these two things cannot operate in unity. But I have found that there are times where in order for the glory realm to fully manifest, there are things that people need deliverance from. And so with further ado, I want to go into this teaching. Um, we're, we're going to actually begin in Luke uh, chapter 8. And I'm going to use this passage of text to give us an example of how we begin to engage in spiritual warfare, but not just with the strategy of individualized deliverance, but over entire territories. It's time for the church to operate in dominion again. And it's time for the church to embrace the kingdom mandate once again. And in order to do that, I do want to say it is impossible to embrace the kingdom mandate without doing deliverance. Because the kingdom is advanced through violence. And so when the scriptures tell us that the, that the kingdom suffered violence and the violence take it by force, it's letting us know that the kingdom is forcibly advanced. The other concept that we must know is that with the church is apostolic, the very context of the word apostle means military career. That means that the church is militant. In fact, I found people, they categorize the church as a hospital, and to me that is a terrible concept of the church. I believe that that concept of the church fights against the very nature of what we actually are. I think we can find what we are in Psalms 82, where it says that God stands in the congregation of the mighty. I th I, I'm not a hospital patient, I am the mighty. I am the mighty. And so God wants to put might back on his church. And might is his power in warfare. It's his power in warfare. So, so let's go to Luke chapter 8, and we're going to um, begin with verse number 26. In fact, no, let's go up, because I think we need to see the full picture here. So let's begin with verse number 22. So we're at Luke chapter 8, verse number 22. And it says, Now it came to pass on one of those days that he entered into a boat himself and his disciples. And he said unto them, Let us go over unto the other side of the lake. And they launched forth. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. And there came down a storm of wind on the lake. And they were filling with water. So they're on a boat in a lake and a storm suddenly comes. And, and look what it says. It says that they were filling with water. So the boat is filling up with water. And they were in jeopardy. And they came to him and awoke him saying, Master, Master, we perish. And he awoke and rebuked the wind. Now I want, want you to see this. What does the scripture say that Jesus rebuked? He rebuked the wind. So this means that Jesus spoke to the wind. Now this is important for us to understand because this is one of the weapons that witches and warlocks operate and use against the church when it was actually designed to obey the voice of the children of men. And it is the wind. It's similar to when, for example, the Bible says, 
that when God wanted to revive the dry bones, how did those bones get revived? God tells Ezekiel to speak, to prophesy, to what? To the, but, but, how, but how did, he, did the bones get revived? He prophesied to the four winds of the earth. So, so here, we actually see Jesus exercising this principle, speaking directly to the winds of the earth that were called to obey the sons of men. Now let's continue. It says, and the raging of the water. So the storm is violent. The water is raging, but Jesus rebukes the wind. And it says, they ceased and they were calm. And he said unto them, where is your faith? Now this is interesting to me because Jesus rebukes them or brings correction to them for not having faith that they could do the same thing as him. And to me, this is a picture of what real discipleship should produce. Discipleship is actually not gaining an accountability partner. It is the strategy of God to raise you to the same level as Jesus. And so this is the intent of, of New Testament discipleship. It is that we come into the full stature and the maturity of Jesus Christ himself. That the servant becomes as the master. Or as he is, so are we, but not when we die. It says here in this world. In fact, the Bible says, know that you will judge angels. So this means that what you are as a born-again believer is a class of being above the angelic realm even. The Bible says that the church will reveal the wisdom of God to principalities. Do you know what that means? That means that who you are, because this is one of the assignments the devil has against the church, is to, uh, is to watch this, hide the identity of Jesus, but it's also the, the purpose of that is because if you don't know who he is, you will not know what you were raised to become just like. And so, because of this, the, the enemy gets us to not understand that even with, when it comes to the realm of revelation, do you know that there are things that God will reveal to us in the end times that the angels don't even know? That's what it meant when it said that we will unveil the wisdom of God to principalities. Now, the Bible tells us in the beginning in Colossians that God created principalities, powers. So this means that these are ranks of authority in the angelic realm. So we know a third of them fell. This means there are still principalities that did not fall. Oh my God. Now, now watch this. So in other words, you as a born again believer will receive revelation that principalities of God don't even know. And they'll learn it when you prophesy it. Y'all don't believe me. Let me give an example. The Bible talks about how we know Lucifer was an angel. He's a fallen angel. Is that correct? Now, we give him way too much credit. Because a lot of times when they talk about even him when before he failed, this is what we do. We talk about, you know, he was the second strongest. If he was the second strongest, how did Michael throw him down? So he wasn't even that strong there. He was strong, but he wasn't that strong there. But here's my point that I'm making to you. Now, we know that before the foundation of the world, the lamb was slain. Is that correct? So this means Jesus was crucified. Why did Satan not know not to lead him to the cross? That means that Satan, even when he was Lucifer, did not have the revelation that he was the lamb. Oh my goodness, I, I don't know. So I want you to remember the principle that I said. The end time church is marked by revelation. And we will be those that we will receive things that even the angelic realm has not heard yet. Secrets and mysteries. This is why Peter said they long to look into these days. Because they know there are things that they will receive and learn or that will be unveiled that they will learn from the church. That's how mighty the church is. Do you see how mighty that is? Do you see how mighty you are? That God will speak some things to a son first. Oh my goodness. Okay. So, so let's take a look at this. Let's take a look at this. So now we know they're on the boat. Jesus has rebuked the storm 
And after he rebukes the storm, he, he tells them this. He says, where is your faith? Because each of them had the potential to do the same thing he just did. And look what he says after this. Because remember, he did this miracle as a man. The Bible says that Jesus, coming back to the ascension, as you were saying, the Bible says that Jesus prayed a prayer toward the end of his earthly ministry. And his prayer was simply this, Father, the glory that I had with you in the beginning. He prayed to be restored back into that glory. The word ascension means an elevated status. So in other words, when Jesus came to the earth as a man, he left the original glory. And so he came as a man, and when he ascended, he went back into the glory that he originally had with the Father. So, the reason why this is important for us to understand, I, I, I'm starting to feel the anointing. The reason this is very important for us to understand here is that who we are called to be is as he is in his ascension. This is what it means when it says, as he, not as he was. This is as he is. And if I took time to show you, I could show you that Jesus was different even when he rose from the dead. That disciples that walked with him for years didn't recognize him after he rose from the dead. So, so when I say as he is, I'm referring to not even as he was when he walked the earth during the three years. I'm saying in his glorified state, that is what you are in the earth. Oh my goodness. So watch this. So it says, Jesus says, where is your faith? Because you're, you're, I've been teaching you to be like me. So where is your faith? And look at this. And being afraid, they marveled. They were afraid of the dimension of the supernatural that they just saw. Oh, my God. And what makes this amazing is it's not like the first time they've seen the supernatural. Now watch this. Remember when Jesus walks on the water? It says when they saw him, they said, we've seen a ghost. This is after they've seen him heal the sick. This, they have saw him prophesy. They have saw him. This is another picture of different realms. You know what the church does today? We'll move in a realm, and then if someone moves in a realm that is greater than the realm we've seen, we call it demonic. That's what the disciples did when they called it a ghost. They were saying, we're, seeing, we're experiencing something that is demonic in nature. The fallen nature of man will always accredit things that are, that are supernatural that we cannot reason to the devil. And this is one of the reasons why the church believes in divination, but we don't believe in prophecy. This is one of the reasons why the church can believe in demonic power, in false signs and wonders, but we can't believe in the authentic signs and wonders. It speaks that our nature is still being renewed. Our mind is still being renewed. Now, now look at this. So being afraid, they marvel, saying to one another, who then is this that he commandeth even the winds and the water, and they obey him? Now, this is the most critical point of everything that I've just taught. I want you to remember that there's a storm while they are on the way to this region. Because, in fact, this is exactly what has happened to Ben. Because the powers that are represented in New Jersey, they are familiar with his ministry. And there is a message that he is carrying that the, this region, the powers in this region, wanted to hinder his arrival into the territory. Now, look at this. So, they, so it says, and they arrived at the country and look at this. When they arrived there, it says, which is over against Galilee. And when he was come forth upon the land, there met him a man, a certain man out of the city who had demons. Now, this is important for us to see because what they're saying is when Jesus rebukes the storm, he, he reaches the coast of where they were headed in the first place. And notice Legion is there waiting for him. This is very important for us to know because demons are, number one, they're not all-knowing. So this means that demons don't have this ability to know everywhere that you are. This will let us know that these spirits were monitoring him. 
that they were specifically keyed in and they had an awareness that he was coming. And not only did they have an awareness that he was coming, they attempted to stop his arrival. Now, look at this. It says this. It says that when he came forth upon the land, there met him a certain man out of the city who had demons. And for a long time, he had worn no clothes and abode not in any house, but in tombs. So he was around graveyards. And when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him. And with a loud voice, he said, what have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? I beseech thee, torment me not. For he was commanding the unclean spirit to come out from the man. So this is a very important part of our text that we have to see. Because this means that when Jesus arrived, this conversation, this that Legion began to have with him, was actually in the midst of Jesus beginning to command him out. This means that every deliverance is not instant. This is very important for us to understand because I have to break the myths surrounding deliverance ministry so that we can do. I I see people preach these types of things that if you say go, then instantly every demon should just come out. But if that's also true, this would mean that every believer should have a 100 percent healing rate, too. For some reason, there is a criticism with deliverance that's not there for any other ministry. If we take the same principles that we apply to the deliverance ministry and apply it to other ministries and other ministries aren't valid today either here what's what I'm saying have you ever saw someone lay hands on someone and it took time for a miracle to happen but there was no one there timing it going okay it, it, it you laid hands more than once okay it's, it's, it's been 30 seconds you should have just touched them and said be healed and it should have happened we only do that with deliverance and now watch this so he's commanding it to come out and as he's commanding it to come out the demon begins to speak to him So this raises the next question. Should demons ever speak while we are doing deliverance ministry? Now, I want to say this. We never get revelation from demons. So we're not asking them where their origin is. We're not asking them. We don't want to know. I don't care where you came from. (laughs) What I do care is you coming out of the person. But my point here is if we begin to preach and if we hold the standard of that Jesus is the blueprint of ministry, if we tell deliverance ministers today that there will never be a time that you will ever have a verbal confrontation with a spirit, then this would make Jesus wrong here in this text. Now, I also want to highlight this too, that Jesus... The son of God, we know that he did more miracles. They said that so many books could be written that the world could not contain the books. So this means that out of every miracle, out of this innumerable number of works that Jesus did, the Holy Spirit had decided that as the gospels were being written to give us specific ones out of that innumerable number. So this means that me and you can conclude that though this is the most rare type of administration of deliverance, that it could have happened more than once. This is the record that we have been given. Oh my God, I feel the anointing. Now, now watch this. So this would also mean that if Jesus is the blueprint, that it would be proud for us to say that I only do deliverance By the revelation gifts, because here in our text, Jesus asked Legion, what's his name? So this means that as Jesus is doing deliverance in this text to be a blueprint for us, he's operating in deliverance as a man and not as God. Jesus does not go. The Lord told me your name. He did not say I foreknew your name. He didn't say I had a dream about what your name was before I came. He looked at the demon and by his authority, he said, what is your name? Now, let's continue because I want you guys to see this because there are myths that the devil and there's confusion that the enemy places around anything that he fears. And and look what happens next. So he's commanding the spirit to come out and it says for oftentimes it had seized him and he was kept under guard and bound with change and fetters 
and breaking the bands asunder. He was given or he was driven of the demons into deserts. And Jesus asked him, this is Jesus, the son of God, our blueprint. He says, what is your name? And one reason why is because we know names hold prophetic significance. This means even demons, their power is in their name. And so it says, and he said, legion for we, look at this, for many demons were entered into him. And I, I'm in the ASV. And they entered or they entreated him that he would not command them to depart into the abyss. Now there was there a herd of many swine feeding on the mountain and they entreated him that he would give them look at this leave to enter into them so in other words they they ask can we go into the pigs we know we have to leave but if we have to leave can we go into the pigs now look what happens here look what happens here verse 33 and the demons came out from the man so now the legions of demons, the legion has gone out from the man. And when they went out from the man, it says they entered the swine and the herd rushed down the steep into the lake and they were drowned. We know some translations tell us they ran violently into the lake. Is that correct? Now, the reason why this is an important fact, I, I want to bring us backwards now. We started with the storm. Notice that the storm is described as being violent. Now, the man, when he sees legion, legion is described as being violent. Now the demons leave the man, and when they, go, when they go into the pigs, the pigs are now violent. This reveals to me and you that the storm came from legion. This reveals why when Jesus rebuked the storm, Legion meets him at the coast when he arrived and bows. Because not only was the storm rebuked, the spirits behind the storm that were in the man were also rebuked. Oh my goodness, I feel the anointing. They run into the water and, and this reveals to us something. Now the Bible does not have any insignificant words in it. Even the genealogies that we read past. Every single thing in the word of God has an important meaning that the Holy Spirit God breathed to us. So when it tells us the detail that the pigs ran into the water, this is extremely significant. And the reason it's significant, it reveals where these spirits were operating from. They were operating from the waters. And this is a class of demons that I call water demons or water spirits. Why do I call them water spirits? It's no different from demons that I speak about in relation to the stars, the sun, and the moon even. For example, did you know that witches will speak incantations into the moon do, have you ever noticed that when you look at Halloween, if they're trying to cartoonize it to make it normal to our children, that they'll have a picture of a witch and you always see full moons? One reason why they do this is because if you notice when the children of Israel left out of Egypt, notice that the Lord shifted the time that they lived by. And he brought them into what we now know as the Jewish calendar, which is based upon the moon, not the sun. So this means... Once again, we see this principle. The devil has to copy what's of the kingdom. And so they're actually manipulating something that's authentic in the supernatural. God, I feel this. So that's why David says, I will not be smitten by the sun by day nor the moon by night. So he understands that the enemy can weaponize the heavens. Oh, my goodness. Let, let me say it to you like this. The Bible tells us this. Oh, my God, I feel the anointing. The Bible tells us this. These spirits go down into the water, because I'm going to tie it all together here in a moment. These spirits go down into the water. Now, the question that we want to present here is why was Jesus okay with the devils leaving the man but not leaving the region? This is often a question that people ask. Why did Jesus seemingly give the devil what he wanted? 
Because notice he, con he confronts the man. The demon manifests. He asks the name. The demons say, we're legion. And the demons are like, look, have you come to torment us before the time? That, that means they're, they're saying this. It's not time yet. Let me explain it to you this way. When Jesus was doing deliverance, he was doing deliverance still under the old covenant. This means he was dealing with a legal devil still. And so the demons knew now, wait a minute, Jesus. We're, we still have legal right to be here. Have you come before the time? Oh, my God. I hope you are catching this. Now, look at this. So, we're headed somewhere strong. So, what happens next? He allows. Now, notice who suggested. Jesus didn't suggest it. The, the legion of spirits say, can we go into the pigs? So now they, they believe wholeheartedly that they had outsmarted God. The devil always does this, by the way. Just like with the cross, he was convinced. He's like, I got him. I got him. <laughs> when, when he calls Adam to sin, he said, I got him. What's funny is the entire fall of man, the enemy used man's appetite for food to cause the fall. Interesting. So this means the devil uses your natural appetites. Now watch this. So let's continue to read, and we're about to see the wisdom of God. This is so powerful. So, so look at this. They, the demons went out of the man. We're at verse 33. And the demons came out of the man and entered into the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep into the lake and were drowned. So the, so the pigs drowned. Now we know spirits they don't die. So where did they go? They went back into the water. And look at this. And when they that fled, so that means there were people that were there that ran. <laughs> Have you ever been in a deliverance session and saw people get scared and leave? It's happened to me. I've, I've seen people literally run out of the building terrified of the devil. So, <laughs> so they fled. And look what it says. And told it in the city. And in the country. And they went out to see what had come to pass. And they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons were going out, sitting with clothes on. This is someone said, This is restoration. So now he's sitting, he has clothes on, and he's in his right mind. He's at the feet of Jesus. But look what it says. And they were afraid. So they're afraid, and look what they look what they said. And and they, look at this, and they that saw it told them how he that was possessed with demons was made whole and all the people of that country. And look at this, they roundabout asked him to depart. Okay, so let me paint this picture. Jesus has just brought deliverance to the most demonized man in the country. He's so demonized that in him, the principality that is operating and oppressing the entire country is operating just through him as one man. The demons come out of the man, they see it, and they say, Jesus, we don't want you here. Sounds like the church. Whenever we see a realm of the supernatural that once again we don't understand, when we reject it, what we're actually doing unknowingly is telling Jesus, we don't want you here. Because one thing about Jesus, he doesn't come on our terms. The Holy Spirit doesn't go, what are you comfortable with? Okay, you don't like fire? Then okay, I, I won't come as a fire. When we reject what he's manifesting, we lose the move of the spirit. Now, look at this, because I want you to see this. this. This is so good. And it says this next. So they were afraid. They tell Jesus, we, we really don't want you to come because they had great fear. So they asked him to depart from them. And it says, and look at this, for they were holding with great fear. And he entered into the boat and returned. But the man from whom the demons were gone out, 
prayed him that he might be with him. So in other words, Legion says, can I be one of your disciples? Now, when I was first reading this, this, this was interesting to me because I'm like, imagine your, your life was just forever changed. You ask the person, can I follow you? And they go, no. <laughs> so, so Jesus says, no, no, I want you to stay here. Now, here's, here's where we're, this is where we're headed now. You guys ready? And so, so he tells them, no. He sent him away telling him, return to your house and declare how great the great things God has done for you. And he went his way publishing throughout the whole city how great things Jesus had done for him. So in other words, he has become a billboard for the kingdom of God. He's become a social media post. And look at this. But this is, this is the piece I wanted you to see, verse 40. And... As Jesus returned, so Jesus came back. So this means Jesus came back. And look what happens when Jesus came back. And Jesus returned, the multitude welcomed him. These were the same people that were afraid of what Jesus carried. Now they've said, Jesus, we welcome you back. The question is why? In the wisdom of God, he left the man there in the region, and every day it reminded them of the, of the demonstration of power that they were originally afraid of. And what transformed them was the fruit. Oh, my God. Someone say the fruit transformed them. So, so there's people in your family that you tell your testimony to, they don't believe you yet. But they begin to believe you when they see the fruit of it. Now, now I'm ready to explain this blueprint. So this, so, so this one story is, is revealing to us how an entire city, region, or country was transformed by an evil altar being broken and destroyed. And so now I'm ready to give you the rest of this teaching. This is going to be good. Now, now that we're here, the enemy cannot operate in a city or region without people. Someone say he cannot operate in a city or region without people. Now, what this also means is that God cannot operate in a city our region without people. Now, I want to give you an example of this, and I'm about to give you this blueprint. Now, because we live in the West, we don't really understand kingdom. So, to, to give us an understanding of us to understand Adam in the first place, we need to understand the kingdom. Now, if me and you, let's say that I'm a king, so I have two, two sons, and let's say that I wanted my oldest son to become a king. I have my own domain. In a kingdom, you cannot become a king while living in the same domain. So what a king will do to give their child their own kingdom is they will send them to a different part of somewhere under their jurisdiction in a colony. And they'll send them and they'll give them their own colony. Do you realize that when, when God made Adam, it was a king giving a son his own colony of a kingdom. So this is why the Bible tells us that the earth or the heavens are the Lord's. And it says, but the earth has been given to man. Someone say the earth has been given to man. So the earth is the world of men. So we could call it dominion. So dominion has been given to who? Now, when you read in the word of God, do y'all remember when Daniel, he got thrown into the lion's den? Why did the king not just get him out? The king liked Daniel. But this is the concept of kingdom that we must understand. Once a king makes a decree, it cannot be changed. So God, before the fall, 
establishes the law of dominion. That whatever will take place on this earth, it has to take place through man. This is why when God was making everything in creation, he's, made, he's speaking to creation, forming it, creating it, making it manifest. Then we know he takes man from the dirt of the earth. He forms man and gives him a body. He breathes the breath of God into him, the Ruach breath. Man becomes a living soul, and now there's a shift. Now, God is no longer speaking to creation. Because Adam now begins to look at the animals, and he begins to name them. Why is this significant? Man was made on what day? Day number six. Why did God wait till day six to make man? Number one, the, all the creation was made where man would be the centerpiece. Number two, it says he rested on the seventh day. Why did he rest? Because now I have made a person that's a replica of me. And so now what I did, they will do. What I've done in heaven, I'm going to use them on earth to make what I've done in heaven. Oh, my goodness. So now he, he rests. <laughs> this is so good. So the law of dominion is that God won't do anything without man. Surely the Lord will do what? Nothing. Nothing. Unless he does what? Finds a man on earth to reveal it to. So this means that without man, things that are in the spirit cannot legally come into the earth. Oh my goodness. So this means you're waiting for your family to be delivered. But you're the portal for the deliverance. You're waiting for someone to be healed. But you're the portal for the healing to happen. So what's this? So God cannot change the law that he establishes. And so because he can't change it, what did he do? <laughs> he comes as a man. Mm. So when Jesus was born of a virgin, God was operating within the original law he established. Oh my goodness. So this means Jesus went to the cross as a man. There's a lot I want to say. But this is my point that I want to bring. The supernatural dimension cannot, it must flow in the earth through man. So because of this, how does this happen? How does this take place? Number one, if the enemy can remove prayer if he can remove prayer he can remove what gives God legal access to intervene in the earth someone say prayer now today in the, in the body of Christ we see many gatherings and I'll give an example if we were having a prophetic gathering, and, and when I say that, I mean a gathering where we advertise it and we say, we will prophesy over every person and give you a personal recording. The entire city is going to come to church that night. But if we say, you know, on Friday night, we're going to go after God in prayer. It's going to be a prayer meeting. You know, we're going to worship and we're going to intercede and we're going to pray over the land. Oh, man, I, something came up, you know, I'm not going to be able to make it tonight. And you will see the smallest number of attendants in the prayer meeting. And the question is why? It's because the, the enemy understands that, that there are things that, that have to be manifested in the earth through the altar of the Lord. And so I want to talk about this really quick. And I want to say this and I want to speed through this part and then we're going to pray. The Bible says that Jesus was slain before the foundation. Someone say before. Now, when Jesus is slain, this means he's a sacrifice. But for there to be a sacrifice, there must be an altar. So this means that Jesus, in the heavens, in the eternal realm, is slain at an eternal altar. 
Now the question would become, why does God have an altar in eternity before the world was created? Because by spiritual law, things in the eternal realm cannot interact with things on earth where there's not an altar. So in order for God to have relationship with man that he, was, that he knew that he was going to create, named Adam, he had to create an eternal altar that gave access of the heavens to the earth. So in a similar way, that when Jacob had his encounter with God, why were the angels ascending and descending in the first place? They were ascending and descending because that very spot was the spot that Abraham built an altar. So this means generations later, the altar still was an open heaven. Oh, my goodness. So you know that the cross, Calvary, is described as a place where the sacrificial lamb was slain. So this means the cross is the altar that reconnected man to the eternal altar. Oh, my goodness. Under, it's, it's called the order of Melchizedek. So this is my point, though. So what are altars for? Number one, they're a place where exchange can happen. They're a place where interaction between the supernatural and the natural can happen. And here's my point that I'm making. The enemy has successfully stolen things that actually belong to the children of God, perverted them, and then convinced us to be afraid of them. Oh, my goodness. So watch this. Did you know that witches and warlocks are not just in Africa? They're not just in Haiti. They're not just in the Caribbean. They're right here in the United States. And some of the strongest ones that you will ever encounter are in this region. Now, I want you to know that the enemy cannot release his agendas without witches and warlocks and, and, and people of the occult. But how do they do it? And I want to show you something. I was preaching about altars um, actually last week at our church. And as I was preaching, a thought hit me, and it was so thought-provoking. And it's this. You can drive down the street in most American cities, and you can see churches. You'll pass many churches on your way to another church. You see churches everywhere. You know where the church is. But where's the witch coven? How is it possible that a group of people that we don't know where they are are the ones dominating a territory? It's because the church has been trying to win cities and regions through physical means. We have been trying to do it without operating in the supernatural. And so because we have been trying to do it, with, by, watch this, because we have vacated the supernatural, the witches and warlocks are, are, are operating in a demonic dominion over territories. So they are ruling through evil altars. Someone say evil altars. Now, now remember this. There's nothing that the devil can do without an altar. So let me explain it like this. Have you ever saw a person, they come up for deliverance, we pray for them. We cast demons out of them. Demon comes out. They throw up in the bucket. As they throw up in the bucket, the next week, they're back manifesting again. We cast the devil out of them again. They come back two weeks later. They need deliverance again. Because we have, we've missed the biggest part of deliverance. The strongest and most critical place that you must target is an altar. And we must understand that altars have, now that we are in the new covenant, an altar can be spiritual in nature and not physical. 
And even as people, we carry the altar of God inside of us because we know that the kingdom is in us. And so what this means is not only is the Holy Spirit inside of you, but the entire king, that means the throne of God is in you. The throne of God is in you. The river of life is inside of you. This is what it meant when it said rivers of living water flow. Everything you read in Revelation, why many believers are asking God to go to heaven is because they don't understand the revelation that heaven is inside of us. They don't realize that in the beginning, God's original intent was for man to, to bring an extension of heaven here. So you have to understand that that's why God in the end makes a new heaven and a new earth. So, th- so why would he make a new earth if we won't live in the earth? Oh, my God. Someone say, we're going to live here. I know. We don't, we, see, you're thinking of heaven. You're thinking of the earth fallen. You will have dual citizenship, but you will live here. The original intent of God is that man will live on the earth. Before the fall, Adam and Eve were where? They were here. Now watch this. Where was the Garden of Eden? Now we know Paul says, I was caught up into the third heaven and I saw what? Paradise. So many believe he saw Eden. This is my point. Heaven and earth were so married as one that while walking on the earth, you could see and experience things that were in the third heaven. Because God never moved Eden. The Bible doesn't say Eden was removed from the earth. What it says is that man was removed from Eden. So this means that Eden never changed locations. Man did. Oh, my God. So Eden never changed location. He moved man's access to Eden at the fall. So this means that when God returns, you're going to receive a glorified body, a redeemed body, and you're still going to live here. (laughs) But the whole creation groans for the manifestation of sons so that creation can be delivered from vanity. That means the earth is going to experience deliverance. And be reconnected to the glory that it was separated from. The earth was so glorious that it brought forth things into maturity at accelerated rates. In fact, when Isaac sowed seed into the land, and it says in the same year, you know what he experienced? He experienced what the earth would have been before the fall in a pocket. His faith giving into a land that wasn't supposed to produce, he tapped, watch this, he operated in a realm above the curse and brought that part of the earth above the curse. Uh, okay. So, so watch this. I, I feel like I, got, I need to speed up. So my point is this. Number one, the church will not be able to operate in dominion without embracing the full spectrum of the supernatural again. Number two, the church must embrace that we must operate in spiritual warfare to transform our regions. Number three, the church must understand that the first place we engage in spiritual warfare is legally dealing with the altars that the enemy's kingdom is operating from. If there's a witch... There's an altar. So instead of dealing with their spells, their hexes, their incantations, if we break the altar, what you do is you've arrested the idol that empowers the person. This is why in 1 Kings, in relationship to Josiah, God says, prophesy against the adulterous altar. And when he says prophesy against it, Notice what he does. When he prophesies against the altar, what happens? It says the altar split. But when it split, it says the king who was, who was feeding that altar, it says he, he stretched out his hand against him. You know why he understood? Without this altar, I can't do what I want to do. The reason people build altars in the demonic world is because they want something from the spirit. 
when you destroy the altar, you disconnect them from their power source. Now, on the flip side, we see all through the Bible where the enemy would attack the altar of God. We would see all through the scriptures that the altars would be broken down, the altars of God, and we see that there's a protocol in the spirit we must understand. And I want to use Gideon as an example. God raises up Gideon. But what does he tell Gideon? He says, Gideon, you're a man of valor. But for me to bring revival to the nation, I first need you to destroy your father's bell. That was the condition. For God to move in the nation first is that the altar, the covenant with that God must be broken down. Oh, I can't use you. This is so good. Oh, my goodness. So, so we see this pattern. Let's use one more. In the days of Elijah, there's an altar of the Lord that's described as broken down. We see it at Mount Carmel. Before Elijah could pray and fire come down from heaven, the altar had to be restored first. Here's why. No prayer on earth is legitimate without an altar. Now let me show you something. Have you noticed in my travels of doing ministry, I can go to a service filled with believers. One warlock can come to the meeting and it hinder the whole meeting. How is it possible for one warlock to walk in and disrupt worship in a group of believers filled with the Holy Spirit? It's often this. Their altar is strong while ours is broken down. What are the signs that the altar of God has been broken in our life? And I want to give you them really quickly. Number one, prayerlessness. It's the first sign that the altar is under attack when we begin to lose the fire of intercession and prayer. The enemy will attack the altar even in churches. There are places where you go, and I'm not sure if there are ministers that travel, where I have discovered that when I stand on the altar, because the altar is erected and being serviced, the fire of God is still burning on that altar, it is easier to move in the things of the Spirit in that place. But where the altar is broken down, it's more difficult because it is the altar that legitimizes spiritual authority. And watch this. Now, I want you to see this. The next sign that the altar of the Lord is, is under attack in a person's life is that the altar, the area of praise and worship is restricted or hindered. It's a sign that the enemy is attacking us and attacking the altar because one of the things that we do at the altar, we are spiritual houses that offer up what? Living. We offer up spiritual sacrifices. This means in the spirit, even if we can't see it, there, there are altars that we are carrying. Whenever we say that a person is carrying realms of God, that means that they are a man that, that, that is carrying. They have become a mobile altar of God. Now watch this. The next thing that the enemy attacks to break down the altar of God is our giving, is our giving. I want you to know this, and this will forever change your, your, your understanding of giving. Did you know that if we preach the order of Melchizedek, you cannot biblically remove the tithe? And I want to go further and say this. Anyone that is preaching that the tithe is not for today is unknowingly saying that there's no priesthood for today. You cannot have a priesthood without the tithe. So hear what I'm saying. When you give, you're actually not just giving money to the church. You're laying it on the altar of Melchizedek. Oh, my God, I feel the anointing. Someone say you're laying it on the altar. It's no different than when, when, when Abraham gave to the king of righteousness who had no mother or father. So who was he giving to? So whenever we give, 
Even if it's through technology in our modern day, you are actually giving into a divine order a higher priesthood than the Levitical one. So, lastly, the next sign that you know that the altar has, has, is, is under attack is, is spiritual famine. Spiritual famine. And, I'm, and it's the last thing I want to say, and then we're going to pray. I think Eli is a great example. And here's where we see. We see a couple things. Number one, the Bible tells us that Eli was in his own place. That's what it says. In his, that means he wasn't where he was supposed to be. He was in his own place. And as he's in his own place, it says this. And the lamp of God had almost gone out. It was almost out. It was dim. It was his responsibility to keep the lamp of God burning. It says revelation was rare in those days. It says his eyes were dim. So this means that there, there was disturbances to hearing the voice of God in his life. Did you know that when the altar of God is strong in your life, this, oh my God, feel the anointing. The, when the altar of God is strong in your life, it can be seen by the patterns that you experience. For example, if the altar of God is, is strong, you notice that the angels ascended and descended upon the altar, your life will be filled with divine encounters. Let me show you a mystery. One reason why many people, when they first get saved, their life is full of encounters, and then the longer they go, they, they, no, they no longer have encounters. You know what happened? When you first got saved, an altar was erected. And over time, through religion and through the trials of life that we go through, that altar doesn't get service. It breaks down, and now the portal is hindered. It's not that the heavens are not open, but you have to understand something. That though the heavens are open, the enemy operates through powers, through, through culture, through different things to disturb those heavens. Okay? So, so hear what I'm saying. You used to dream. Your life was full of divine dreams. Now the only dreams that you have are demonic. That's a sign of an altar that needs to be destroyed because that's the activity coming through it. So negative dreams is a sign that there's an altar that needs to be destroyed. Oh my goodness. And a person can carry more than one altar. This is why Abraham did not just build one. He built four altars in his lifetime. So you can have an altar of prayer. You can have an altar. Oh, my God, I feel this. Of financial prosperity. You can have an altar of favor. But there could be altars in the demonic world. There's altars of witchcraft. There can be altars of sexual immorality. There could be altars. You know, another sign that an altar is in a family is that in your bloodline, that when you begin to look, there's a pattern in the bloodline that is wicked in nature. So we're praying, but you're not targeting the altar, which is why the prayer has not worked. Now watch this. So Eli's eyes were dim. The fire was almost out. Revelation was rare in those days. These are signs that the altar has been broken down. This is one of the reasons why, though they still had the ark, this is why when they took the ark into battle, it's why it was stolen. It was stolen because God was speaking to them that, that, the, that the altar of the Lord and the nation had really been broken down. And so you cannot remove an altar. So this leads me to my last point. You cannot remove an altar without erecting a, a stronger one. So now, with that said, I want to lead you in a prayer. Um, and this prayer um, is meant to do several things. Number one, our goal is to destroy altars that the enemy has established in this city and in this region. Now, the altar, sometimes when we, when we do these types of prayers, the one meeting does not completely destroy the altars. It damages them. And so it is the continued intercession at times that will completely collapse an evil altar. And the evidence of it will be the patterns that we see within our city and region. Things like the crime rate will go down. Things of that nature will begin to take place. But also, this prayer is going to destroy altars that have been established by the enemy in your bloodline. 
And these altars can speak against the things that God desires to do in our life. Because I want you to understand something. We are all born again in this room, every single one of us. But, but I want to present to you a question really quickly. Because I know that we, we all have, we could have differing theology, and I think that's okay. But I at least want to present this. If we take the same principle, that if someone is, is saved, that they are instantly delivered, we would have to apply that to healing. We would have to because we know that many sicknesses, according to the word of God, are even described as being demonic in nature. So the question is, if when you get saved, you're instantly delivered of everything, just instantly, of any demon, if they all go instantly, why don't sicknesses and, and diseases instantly leave? Why are there believers that love Jesus with everything in their heart. They're not bad people. They did nothing for, for that sickness to be in their body necessarily. Why didn't they instantly, when they gave their life to Jesus, the sickness come out of their body? Because this, salvation, salvation is the beginning of our deliverance. You cannot even begin to be delivered until you are saved. And this is why the Bible says that you were translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. So what this means is before you gave your life to Jesus, not only were you being oppressed by the devil, but you were actually a part of Satan's kingdom. So God is not going to deliver a person that is legally a part of Satan's kingdom. So how does he begin the deliverance? The deliverance begins with you becoming legally a son, being adopted, and now that you're adopted, the deliverance can't really begin. So salvation was our first deliverance. But after that, we continue to receive what's called the children's bread. Someone say the children's bread. So this means that you may be in this room, born again, saved, but you see cycles in your life. You are still struggling financially. It's been 20 years, and I'm still struggling financially. That's not the, that is not the will of God, and it didn't just vanish when you got saved. That's a need of deliverance. Psalms 82 talks about delivering those that are in need, and it was in reference to finances. The Bible says poverty is for the destruction of the poor. Sickness and disease, many of those, many diseases, the root of them are, is oftentimes spirits of death and infirmity. The strong man behind every manifestation of sickness and disease is the spirit of death. It is a manifestation of death. Watch this. This is why Jesus, when he prayed for Peter's mother-in-law, notice he lays hands on her for a fever. You know why? Because sometimes the spirit of death will enter into a person's body and so that we don't pray, it will manifest through something that we view as minor and normal. But, but now that it's in the body, it will later manifest as a, as a terminal illness. So it's still a spirit of death that is operating. So, so, so watch this. So, so the enemy has convinced the church that we don't have any need of deliverance, and that deliverance is for the world. But there's no way to biblically state that a person that is still not a part of God's kingdom, that a demon can be cast out of them and stay out of them because it can legally be there. So this means deliverance is for believers. Someone say it's for believers. One more thing, because I just want to make sure that we biblically understand before we pray. Even when we look at the Seraphonician woman, notice she comes to Jesus. Her daughter's vexed with the devil. Notice God moves by covenant. Notice what he says. I can't pray for you. I can't pray for you because I can't give the children's bread to dogs. What was he saying? I'm not, God, watch this, God is not in covenant with you right now. God's covenant is with Israel. So this means the children's bread is for those who are in covenant with God. But then what she does is she operates in a realm of faith, which faith knows no time. So she actually receives the children's bread because she rose above the time that they were in and access by faith the new covenant. So this lets us know that when it comes to deliverance, 
It is connected to covenant, and we are now under a new covenant. Someone say we're in a new covenant. This is why the deliverance ministry is an end time ministry. We'll see. In fact, the cross is evidence that deliverance would only get stronger. Because now the ordinances that were written against us have been nailed to the cross. So what this means is every legal right that the devil had to our bloodline through the cross and through the blood of Jesus, these things can be put away. So watch this. Oh, my God, I feel the anointing. The cross. Now, now this is the difference in the covenants. We have under the old covenant the covering of sin. Someone say the covering of sin. So this means that when they would use the blood of bulls and goats, when they would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat, on the day of atonement, it would cover the sin for that year. It didn't get rid of it, though. It was still there, but it would be covered. Under the new covenant, we have what's called the remission of sin. So this means covering of sin is an Old Testament concept. Remission of sin means that when the blood cleanses it, it's, it no longer exists. So this means, oh my goodness, when we repent, we activate the cleansing power of the blood and it removes the sin that gave the devil, watch this, the accusation to receive permission to attack that area of your life. Because even the devil operates by the law of God. So he has to go and get permitted. And what he does is he accuses you. And he goes, God, doesn't your word say this? Well, they violated it. And God in his integrity... He has to permit it. There's some stuff that God wants to wipe off of Satan's book of accusations. Oh my God. The high priest, Joshua, the Bible says, that the devil was opposing him. Now, why was the devil opposing him? As the high priest, his position carried the influence over the entire nation. And what it says in the word of God is that his garments were defiled. So what this means is there were things that God legally could not do for Israel. <sighs> because of defilement... Because the enemy had legal right to oppose. So the strategy of God was to, watch this, remove the defiled garments. Because what he was really doing was removing the legal rights of the devil. So what if I told you this? In the spirit, there are accusations that are actually true. That if, uh, now watch this, watch this though. Notice what I said about the covering versus the remission of sin. Now watch this. So sin is eternal. Someone say sin is actually eternal. That's why the sin of Adam affected all of eternity. Watch this. It affected man eternally. God had to come, so you see this, and deal with sin with his blood. This means the sin of Adam was also dealt with at the cross. The first sin ever was dealt with at the cross. So this is my point. If someone's in your bloodline and they never repented, the sin is still there. And if the sin is still there, the accusation is still there. So watch this. So there, there are things speaking against your destiny for things that happened 20 generations ago. So, so what, I'm, what I'm dismantling right now, 
is the idea, well, I'm a great Christian. Well, this may not even be a war that you started. It could be something that's in your bloodline. Let's pray. I want, if you can, I want you to stand up to your feet. We're going to pray. I want you to begin to pray in your heavenly languages. If you, if you pray in tongues, if you don't pray in tongues, I just want you to begin to pray and start asking the Holy Spirit to move in this place, to move in your life. That's why I just begin to, to pray because as we start to pray, the presence and the fire of God is going to start to confront demon powers that have been hindering not just you, but your children, your family, the city. Just begin to pray in the Holy Ghost for a moment. That's right, you're a warrior. David was a man that loved the presence of God, but he was also a warrior. Someone say God wants to put a Davidic anointing on the church. That means that not only do we worship in intimacy, but we slay giants as well. Come on, we slay giants as well. Are there any giant slayers in the house? Come on, you're going to slay the giant of cancer in your family. Come on, you're going to slay the giant of barren wombs. You're going to slay the giant, come on, of miscarriage. You're going to slay the giant of teen pregnancy, of divorce. You're going to slay the giant. Come on, but you have to rise up as a warrior. Come on, I want you to begin to pray like a warrior. That's right, come on, come on and pray. Come on, pray like a warrior. That's right, come on and pray like a warrior. Come on and pray like a warrior. You might be tired in your body, but I want you to know the devil doesn't care that you're tired. The devil isn't going to give you a break because you're tired. The devil isn't going to give you a break. Come on. He, he is there to wear out the saints. But there's a fire that God wants to release on you. Come on. There's a fire that God wants to release on you. Right now as we're praying in tongues, as we are lifting up our voice, I release the fire of the Holy Spirit. I release the blood of Jesus into this atmosphere. I release the blood of Jesus in the atmospheres of those that are watching online. Lord, let the fire of the Holy Spirit, let your fire begin to come upon every person that is in this atmosphere right now. I pray that in Jesus' name, God, that as we are in prayer, that by the blood of Jesus, by the blood of Yahshua, that we would step into the courts of heaven. And Heavenly Father, our righteous judge, our perfect judge, as we stand in the courts of heaven, we pray that you would open up the books concerning us, that you would open up the books concerning our family. And right now, we thank you for the heavenly host of angels that are present within your courtroom. Right now, Lord, we are coming before you asking to bring our case before you. Lord, in our bloodline, we know that there are evil altars that have been established. Lord, in our bloodline, our ancestors, they've worshipped other gods. They have worshipped other idols. They have been involved in witchcraft. And we come before you right now, repenting for every sin that we have committed against you. We repent of every sin that has been committed in our bloodline and that we have committed against you, Lord. We repent for sexual immorality. We repent for witchcraft and occult involvement. We repent right now, God, for every single transgression against the law of God. Right now, we're asking you, Lord, that you would look at every accusation that has been raised against me and my generations. And Lord, you said in your word to agree with your adversary quickly. And Lord, the accusations that the devil has been releasing against my family, they are true, but we are present to repent of them. 
Right now, we repent on behalf of our family. And Lord, you said in your word that you are faithful and just to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Lord, we stand in the gap right now and we repent on behalf of this region and territory. Right now, God, we confess that this territory has sinned against you. We confess that this region has transgressed against you. We repent for every ritual. We repent right now for every evil sacrifice that's been done. Every evil altar and altar and shrine that's been erected here. We confess, God, that we have rebelled against your word and your way. We repent for government corruption in this territory. Right now, Lord, we repent that the blood of Jesus would put away every sin that has been speaking against us in the spirit realm. Now, Father, we thank you that the blood of Jesus would speak on our behalf. That the blood of Jesus would be a voice of mercy. And that mercy would triumph over judgment. Right now, Lord, we are moving and petitioning that every altar of water spirits that's been erected here in this region and even in our lives, every altar to incubus, every altar to succubus, every altar to the spirit spouse, every altar, Lord, we are moving that you dismantle it by your power in the name of of Jesus. And so now, God, we ask you that you would issue a righteous verdict against every evil altar that has been operating against the church in this region, against this ministry, against the government in this region, but even against our family and our bloodline. We are, are moving that you would arrest every witch and every warlock that has been operating against us in this region. Lord, let the earth vomit and not work with any witch or warlock in Jesus' name. And so, Holy Spirit, we declare that your divine verdict has arrested the enemy in our bloodline and every altar that have been speaking against us let the altar be split and let the ashes of it be poured out in the name of Jesus. We break every evil altar that's been operating. Every altar of poverty be split apart. Every altar of sexual immorality be split apart. Every altar of witchcraft be split apart. Every altar of stagnation be split apart. Every altar of sickness and disease be split apart. We command every altar of, of lack of progress of the church be split apart right now. In the name of Jesus, and I command every demon power that has been operating in the bodies, in the minds, and in the members of your people to come out of their bloodline by the fire of God. In the name of Jesus, I command every water spirit to come out right now by the fire of the Holy Ghost. Let every water spirit begin to come out by the fire of God. You sickness, you disease, you spirit of death, I command you to come out right now. You demon of witchcraft, come out of them right now. You spirit, you demonic power that's been operating against their finances, come out. You python, come out of them. You serpent, come out of them. In the name of Jesus, Lord, according to the authority of the courts of heaven, I move that you put a hook in, the, in Leviathan. I move that you would begin to crush the seven heads of Leviathan that have been operating against your people in these families. Lord, you said that no man can deal with Leviathan. So we petition you by the courts of heaven to deal with the power of Leviathan. And now, Lord, by your authority, punish Leviathan in our region and in the bloodline of my family in the mighty name of Jesus. Now, real fast, when I say this prayer, some of you are going to begin to experience deliverance. 
And I want you to know how you are able to tell if you begin to go through deliverance. Now, there are different ways. I'm going to give an example. Remember the boy that Elisha raised from the dead? When he was raised from the dead, the Bible says he sneezed seven times. These were the seven spirits that were behind his death coming out of his body. And so there are ways that demons come out of people. And I'll tell you, one of them is through tears. Sometimes as people are crying, what is actually happening is that they are being delivered. And oftentimes these deliverances are associated to traumas and heart conditions. One of the way that, ways that the devil rules people's life is through trauma. So his intent when he brings a person into trauma, let's say through rape, through molestation, it is to permanently damage their life. It is to affect them forever. Abuse, physical abuse, verbal abuse, these are ways that people become demonized oftentimes as children. Make no mistake about it, that wasn't just a random incident. That was the enemy engineering a bondage that would attempt to remain in your life. Now here it is, you get married and you're not able to give yourself to your spouse because the way that you view intimacy is connected to the trauma. Now, if someone has a fear and, and, and now you're, you have all these phobias and all these fears, it's oftentimes through a trauma that you experience and the enemy's ruling your life through fear. Now you won't even walk into your destiny because you have fear about doing everything and there's an unusual spirit of fear. Some people are, have the fear of death and, it's, and oftentimes this fear of death is associated to the spirit of death is actually following and pursuing that person in that bloodline. And fear can become the open door. That's why Job said, the thing I feared the most has come upon me. And so sometimes the enemy uses the spirit of fear to project thoughts into you and imaginations because your mind has the power, to, the creative power of God to create things in the earth. So we are engineering our own um, downfall or engineering our own bad experience. The enemy using our authority as man through the law of dominion through us. So some people will begin to uh, get nauseous. So it'd be some that you may feel like you need to throw up. This is another sign of deliverance. It tends to be more universal. Many people that are going through deliverance, they experience that as well. Another sign of deliverance is yawning. So if like, for example, I know it's late, but let's say you're a night owl. You literally, you're 100% up late every day. And then when I began to teach on evil altars, when I began to take us through that prayer, all of a sudden you just started yawning. Oftentimes spirits are, are, are breath. They are wind. So these are spirits coming out as well. Sometimes we cough demons out. So in a similar way where the body gets rid of sickness, uh, spiritually, this is also a way demons exit out of the body as well. Um, burping can be another way. Uh, where people are going through deliverance where they begin to burp and there's demons coming out as well. Um, I think I said uh, yawning, coughing, burping, sneezing is another way. Um, and then the way that I hope nobody experiences while we are here is using the restroom. Is also another way that unclean spirits can come out as well. Um, I have done deliverance on people that have had African witchcraft done on them. Um, and when they had African witchcraft done on them, they, they literally drove to our ministry. We did deliverance on them, and they were going to the bathroom after the, the deliverance for an entire day. It was completely unnatural, supernatural. But it was because they had eaten food that, was, uh, that witchcraft was done on the food. Um, and it was in their system, and they, and they were literally dying from the evil food. Foods, are, foods can be cursed. That's why the Bible says even when we eat, do it unto the glory of God. So even individuals that when you lay down at night, if you have dreams of being fed food, oftentimes that's, you need deliverance. Because in the, in the spirit realm, food is about fellowship. Food is about covenant. So it's one of the ways that the enemy creates a covenant with you that you don't even know. So, so, so a, a spirit spouse, for example, can come give you food and establish a covenant with you. And so now when you're going through deliverance prayer, the demon's not coming out because it says we have a covenant. And so even evil foods, evil drinks. Um, another example is, um, and I'm trying to keep it PG, uh, but intimacy in a dream is very demonic. It's one of the most demonic things that, that can happen. Um, and one reason why is because in the spirit realm, this is how marriage is established. So it's another form of covenant. So the spirit, when, when you married your spouse, notice that the consummation of the marriage required intimacy. 
Why? Because that is the way that covenant is established. In fact, if you look at the way that God designed the human body naturally, um, it, the, the part of a woman in virginity, et cetera, et cetera, you guys understand where I'm going. I don't think I need to go in much detail there. But it, it, it represents covenant, which is why blood is there. So it's intended to establish covenant between you and your spouse. And so... With that said, the enemy perverts this, and he's able to bring people into bondages. And, and what we do is we say, well, that happened to me years ago. Well, remember, we're talking about something that is spiritual. That means it could have happened to you when you were 12. If you never received deliverance from it, it could still be affecting you today. It could be the reason someone is single. It could be the reason that someone's marriage suffers. I have a spiritual daughter that they were not able to have children. We did deliverance on them, and when she got home after we did the deliverance on them, she had a dream, and there was a witch in her dream. And the witch looked at her and said, I am the one that is blocking your womb. And so she comes back and tells us the dream. So now we shifted the prayer, and we began to directly pray against the witch that was blocking her womb. They now have a baby that's, that I think, how old is little Hazel? She, she's... She's, not, you said nine months? So she's nine months old. They were completely unable to have a baby. We did deliverance. They got pregnant a little bit later. Um, I've seen witchcraft at such high levels. I, there was a, a person that I knew. They lived in New Orleans or close to New Orleans. They reached out to me because they had, uh, I think it's called cirrhosis of the liver. Now, it's usually a condition you get if you're a severe alcoholic. This person had never drunk alcohol before. So when the doctor looked at it, they said, you have the liver of an old woman. This person is in their 30s. So she reaches out to us for, for deliverance. As we were praying for her, I heard the Lord say this to me. And I never heard the Lord say this before this. He said, reverse the evil exchange. And I said, okay. I prayed against the evil exchange. And she starts to go through deliverance. Demon comes out of her. We don't think much of it. But then the Lord leads me to ask her, tell me about any dreams that you had that you think may be connected to this. She said, well, you know what? I did have a dream that I was laying on a stone table, and there were women's around, women around me in a circle, and they began to chant, and then they took a knife and they cut me where my liver is in the dream. Do you realize what happened there? It's what's called an evil exchange. In other words, there are witches and warlocks that in order to sustain their life, they steal body parts that are physical from the spiritual. These things were, are happening right here in the United States. And the, razor, the way they're able to do it is that they steal what's called virtues. You know when a celebrity, oh, watch this, oh my God, I feel the anointing. I do. I'm trying to, I want to minister deliverance and, and y'all are starting to pull on me. That means it's the hunger is rising and that's why I can't stop flowing. Look at this. If the devil cannot create life, how can someone go to a witch doctor and get pregnant by the witch doctor? Do you realize how the devil is able to give someone a baby through a witch doctor? They steal someone's ability to have a child and give it to another. The devil's entire kingdom is built on stealing. Steal, kill, destroy. They steal. They steal, and there's a demonic exchange system. This is what the Bible is referring to when it says, what will a man give for his soul? Give the devil something, and he'll give you something else. But where does the devil get it from? He steals it from you. So, there are, there, so, so watch this. So when a celebrity has wealth, whose wealth do they get? They've stolen the church's wealth. Oh, my goodness, I feel the anointing of God. When, when the devil, when, when someone that's a celebrity can go to, because this happens, by the way. They call them spiritual advisors. They're really witches. And they understand spiritual principles that we don't understand. The Bible says, if you know the ordinances of the, it says, do you know the ordinances of the heavens that you might establish their rule on earth? This means the, 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 what, the operation of what takes place in earth is always orchestrated from something spiritual. Or that happens in the spiritual. Nothing that you see on earth does not have a spiritual cause. So they go to, to this witch and they say, I want to be famous. You know what they did? There was a calling that the devil robbed someone of. 
that would have required them to come into influence. The devil takes that influence and he places it upon the celebrity. He's a thief. He's a robber. One more thing. I, I, I'm sorry. Am I doing okay on time? I just want to, if I, if I, I know it's, it's getting late. So let me, let me, let me bring this into an end. How can I say this? So that when Jesus was born, kings brought him gifts. So he receives gifts from the magis. Is that correct? This means the plan of God. This is the plan of God because Jesus is our blueprint. The blueprint is that you would be born already with everything you need for your destiny. But what the devil does, he steals from your bloodline. And once he takes it from your bloodline, you never had it, so you assume it was never stolen. And the only way to recover what the devil has stolen from your bloodline is deliverance ministry. It's learning the ordinances of heaven and using, do you know there are witches that can stir the ocean and send hurricanes as weapons? This is what Job experienced when it says a great wind blew and knocked his house down and killed his children. It was a demonic wind. Same wind Jesus rebuked while they were on the boat. If Jesus did not know the ordinances of the heaven, they all would have died in the lake. There are things we have suffered only because we don't understand the supernatural. So let me say this prayer, and this is the foundation, of course, because as we go through the weekend, there'll be more ministry. For example, there's an impartation. You don't want to miss a day. I'm telling you, you don't want to miss a session. You don't want to miss tomorrow night. You don't want to miss Sunday. God is, something is opening right now. So let me pray for you, Father. In the name of Jesus, I reverse every evil exchange that has ever been done on any person that is in this room. I command every destiny that has been stolen to be recovered by the fire of God. I command every birthright that the enemy has traded to be restored in Jesus' name. Right now, by God's fire, Everything that has been rewritten and manipulated by witchcraft in the life of every person that is under the sound of my voice in your bloodline, I command that manipulation to be broken and I command your life to be restored back to God's original intent. Father, in Jesus' mighty name, all greatness, all glory that has been stolen in exchange in the demonic world concerning your bloodline, I command it to be restored. I command it to be given back. I command it to be vomited up. And now, Lord, I judge by the fire of God every serpent that has swallowed your wealth according to the word of God in Job. And I command the wealth that has been swallowed by the serpent to be vomited up and come back into the hands of your people. Let every virtue taken in dreams, let every virtue that has been taken throughout life, let every virtue that has been taken through trauma, let every initiation that's been done through rape, through molestation, through abuse, I release the healing power of God upon your soul and I command the spirit of trauma to come out of you in Jesus name and I declare that every doorway that has been opened to the devil into your bloodline let the fire of God close that demonic portal forever and let the blood of Jesus completely cleanse your bloodline and heal your foundations in the name of Jesus we pray amen come on and just give Jesus a big hand